This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. You've just released the second version of Grain Brain. What did you find that was new? To me, the first thing that comes to mind is just the degree of validation. What's something that you're really passionate about right now? I believe that what we're seeing globally is something called disconnection syndrome. How has it been for you pushing that and being on the fringe as a medical doctor? Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. What does that say about you? You're the person that wanted to fly into the eye of the hurricane. Oh, wow. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Expert Series, where you'll meet 25 of the world leaders in health and wellness, discussing their passions and what it takes to make your shift. There's an electrical feeling in the room. I had to be a mom. It was so important to me. I've always been a pain in the butt, and I love that. I knew that I wanted to help people. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. Hi, I'm Catherine Maslin, naturopath, author, and host of The Shift. In the expert series, we share the insights, stories, and expertise of each of our amazing experts. You might have met them on season one of The Shift, where we took snippets of these conversations and put them together into the series. If you haven't listened to season one yet, I'd recommend going back and listening to episode one on what it takes to make a shift in your gut health. We'll provide a link in the show notes. In this episode, we have Dr. David Perlmutter, a board-certified neurologist, author, and a passionate voice for prevention, wellness, and longevity. David is somewhat of a rarity. He's an integrative neurologist, which means that his main focus is using a model of healthcare in which lifestyle medicine is seen as an essential part of care. This is very different to traditional neurology, where medical management is usually medication-based. Dr. David's holistic approach to healthcare, particularly in the area of neurology, has led him to become one of the world leaders in the areas of Alzheimer's prevention and brain health. You may have seen him on Oprah, The Larry King Show, Dr. Oz, CNN, Fox News, amongst others. He is the author of seven books, including the New York Times bestseller Grain Brain, which has sold over 1.5 million copies and has been translated into 34 different languages. His latest book, Brainwash, was co-authored with his son, Dr. Austin Perlmutter, and focuses on the newly emerging field called disconnection syndrome. What we learned in season one of The Shift was the absolute importance of gut health when it came to the health of our brain. Of course, I had to talk to David about this, and we learned some very insightful things. But we spoke about so much more than we can use in season one of The Shift, so I'm so pleased to release the juiciest bits of our conversation to you. Make sure you listen out for David's story of becoming a neurologist, why he thinks grains and carbohydrates can be problematic for a lot of us, the patient that miraculously ended his migraine headaches, the link between ADHD and Parkinson's disease, and of course, what you need to do to make a shift. I love this conversation and I hope that you do too. First up, I asked David to tell us in his own words what he does. My name is David Perlmutter. I'm a medical doctor. I'm actually a neurologist. And I do a lot of work in looking at the relationship between lifestyle choices and health, and perhaps more particularly brain health. Uh, I'm really focused on prevention as it relates to the brain uh, and brain disorders like Alzheimer's, and have really been deeply involved in understanding how nutrition is so influential as it relates to choosing the brain's destiny. Where are you from? Where were you born? Not far from here, Miami, Florida. When did you decide that you wanted to become a doctor? I think halfway through my first year at university, I was a business major <laughs> and I decided, uh, I think what kept me from wanting to go to in pre-med was, oh, all these difficult courses uh, that I would have to take physics and biochemistry and organic chemistry. And because in high school, I was an underperformer. I had other interests in high school. I was in a 
rock band and we just had, high school was for fun. Finally, when I got to college, I realized, well, I want to go somewhere. I don't know what it's going to be in terms of my, uh, my choice of career. So I started to work and I realized I could get good grades if I worked. And I finally realized, you know, because uh, I wanted to be a doctor early on in life. Actually, what I really wanted to be was a meteorologist. And again, I decided not to be a meteorologist because you had to take physics and calculus and all these difficult courses. I thought, oh, I can't do those. I don't know if it was so much as I thought I couldn't do them, but I didn't want to be bothered because I had, I enjoyed the good life. Why did you want to be a meteorologist? Well, I grew up in South Florida. I wanted to be a hurricane specialist. I actually wanted to be one of those individuals who flew into the hurricane in the airplane. That was the goal. And I used to spend my, my weekends visiting the National Hurricane Center, which was a bike ride away from my home. What does that say about you, that you wanted, you were the, you're the person that wanted to fly into the eye of the hurricane? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, truthfully, the eye of the hurricane is the calmest place. We get to the calmest place by going through the most aggressive. And it's a very interesting metaphor. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, thus far, you know, as I move forward, clearly it's been challenging. Uh, it's been windy. It's been um, stormy. But I'm reaching the eye of the storm where now the world is shifting and the winds are starting to abate. And there's a Greek term called katabasis. Interestingly, what well, it means the winds are calming down. And it's been applied scientifically to the resolution of inflammation in the human body when certain chemical pathways have been activated. So I think that's where I am now. Why did you choose neurology as a specialty? I'd been exposed to brain disorders and uh, through my father being a neurosurgeon, I used to go to the operating room when I was 12 years old and watch brain surgery. And, uh, and he would discuss various brain disorders with me and quiz me at the dinner table. Do you remember what I told you last night about Marcia Fava Bignami syndrome being related to Italian men drinking red wine? And I'd say, oh yeah, dad, I remember that. And they got degeneration of the corpus callosum. And so that was my relationship with my dad. It was one of the few ways that I could relate to him. So I jumped on it. So uh, exposure to brain health early in life. And what happened once you left that conventional practice with the other neurologists? Well, I found it very uh, invigorating because there was a whole world out there already setting the stage for this. The science was already being done. The studies were being published relating nutrition to brain health, for example. I was completely unaware. And to discover that was a brand new playing field, much like the discovering of, of the microbiome uh, which was very recent, suddenly a brand new playing field and amplification of the number of tools in the toolbox. So how did you go down this path of looking at more of the nutrition and the integrative route rather than being the traditional medical doctor? I will tell you, Catherine, that, that that's not the first time I've been asked that question. And I've even asked that question of myself many times over the years. And I think in a word, it would probably be dissatisfaction that the treatments we were offering for people with neurological conditions uh, were really A, ineffective, and B, treating only symptoms, not the underlying problem. So I became very frustrated with treating the smoke and ignoring the fire and began to explore uh, what was the well-respected medical literature telling us involved in causing the very diseases that we were trying to treat. And it turns out that diet was a big player and no one was talking about it. And truthfully, uh, even to this day, nutrition as it relates to the brain gets very little attention. So tell me, what did you begin to see once you started looking at lifestyle rather than just drug intervention? Uh, to be clear, I didn't abandon the use of pharmaceuticals, nor have I abandoned them to this day. I, I've looked upon uh, them as an adjunct, as are the lifestyle changes, including dietary changes, that these things work together in an integrative way. That's amazing. So tell me, what was your first book? Well, actually, I wrote a book many years ago called Life Guide, and I typed every word, and I self-published, and it dealt with things like multiple sclerosis and headache treatment, epilepsy. And um, after that, I wrote a book called Brain Recovery. 
a then a book about raising a smarter child by kindergarten, uh, the neuroscience of enlightenment, the better brain book, grain brain, uh, grain brain cookbook, grain brain whole life plan, brain maker, which dealt with the uh, microbiome, the gut bacteria, uh, the five year grain brain revision recently published, and then a future book that will come out in January of 2020 uh, called Brainwash. Ooh, tell me about Brainwash. What's that going to be? Well, about? Brainwash is a very uh, exciting book. I'm writing it with my son, our son, who's an MD, internal medicine specialist. And it deals with, first of all, recognizing how uh, our brains and brain functionality are being manipulated by modern society through our adventures on social media, uh, through uh, the time we spend uh, on our cell phones and being manipulated for the gain of others and costing us really our chance to be happy. So tell me a little bit more about cell phones and their effect on us as a rule. Well, I think what we're realizing about cell phone usage is, you know, it's often been said that when you're doing one thing, you're not doing something else. When you're on your cell phone or when you're dedicated to social media on your screen through whatever medium it is, you're not interacting with people in a direct way, making eye contact, feeling their emotions, experiencing their emotions. You're not outside experiencing nature. You're not exercising. Likely your sleep will not be as salubrious as it would have been. So there are many things that don't happen when we spend so many hours a day dedicated to screen time in general. So I think too, um, this series is about gut health, but it does tie back to gut health because if you're in that situation, you're going to be more stressed, you're going to be more in flight or fight, you're in that kind of heightened state. And as a result of that, then gut health, I think, is going to be affected. Well, I think you make a very good point. And I think um, that we're just beginning to understand that many of our lifestyle choices, if not all of them, ultimately manifest as changes in gut uh, health, gut functionality. Of course, everybody can get their arms around the notion that the foods you eat will affect the health of the gut. So can you tell me a little bit more about the gut and its role in inflammation in the brain? Sure. So the gut is actually where the set point for inflammation in the body is determined. We need to maintain the integrity of the gut lining so that certain proteins, uh, certain bacterial products, a certain components of bacteria uh, don't make their way across that gut lining to then challenge the immune system and turn on inflammation. One of the most uh, pervasive uh, chemicals, certainly the most well-studied, is something called LPS, which means lipopolysaccharide. And lipopolysaccharide is the covering over a large group of bacteria. When there's permeability or the gates are opened in the lining, this lipopolysaccharide can make its way across the gut lining, challenge the immune system, and absolutely amp up inflammation. About the worst thing that that could happen. And what's the result of that in the body? So the downstream damage done by inflammation and these inflammatory chemicals, uh, things like interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, is that they ultimately compromise the functionality of the mitochondria and as such lead to increased production of damaging chemicals called free radicals. And it's these free radicals that damage things like our DNA, protein, and fat. So that then connects our lifestyle choices through the lens of what's going on in the gut to increased free radical activity, damaging of our tissues, and degeneration of the human body. So my mission, and obviously your mission, is to do your very best to raise awareness uh, as to what the science is actually telling us today. The science told us uh, decades ago that we should stop saturated fat, we shouldn't eat a high fat diet, and we should eat a lot more carbs. We had here in America the food pyramid. When you look at the food pyramid, the very basis of the food pyramid was bread and pasta and cereal and grains which are about the worst foods you could eat. For me, not just from a brain perspective, but from a coronary artery perspective, diabetes perspective, and cancer perspective as well. And I would indicate that 
you know, Catherine, it's not just that your guest today on your on your interview is saying this, but this is what our most well-respected research is telling us. Stop the carbs. Eat carbs that are representing dietary fiber, that's for sure. So it's really more of a net carbs discussion than total carbs. Can you tell me what that means? So consuming carbohydrate means all carbohydrate. When you look at that number, and there are some good carbs and we call them dietary fiber. They're very important for us uh, specifically because they nurture our gut bacteria. We do not metabolize those. They do not raise blood sugar. They actually help to lower blood sugar. It's the more simple carbohydrates that are the threat for our health. So to determine the net carbs, we take total carbohydrate in a given food, we subtract the dietary fiber. And to be more specific, we would subtract uh, the sugar alcohols if it happens to contain any of those as well. But that said, that brings up an interesting point because uh, sometimes people go totally low carb and omit their dietary fiber as well. And they get into trouble health-wise because you need dietary fiber, again, to nurture your gut bacteria, to maintain the integrity of the gut lining. Want to look deeper into your own health? Our virtual naturopathic team help people from all over the world to shift their health and their life. We offer a 90-minute online discovery and diagnostic session where you can find out where you're at, why you're here, and what you need to do about it. Everyone is so unique, and sometimes it can help to have someone break down your journey and see where it is that you need to head next. To find out more, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Shift With Us. The Shift! What I love about the microbiome conversation, all the research and things that are coming out, is the way that it's changing this compartmentalization of medicine. So going neurology, we're looking at the brain and nervous system, and that's all, and what's affecting it. What other studies are really remarkable about the microbiome in relation to brain health and moods? So a really wonderful researcher named Dr. Emron Mayer at the University of California, Los Angeles, has actually written a book on this. And, and uh, he actually performed a very interesting study where he gave a yogurt enriched with probiotics to a group of women and measured brain activity when they were challenged with images that were uh, somewhat disquieting compared to another part of the group who got the yogurt that didn't have bacteria in it and compared to another group of women who did not get any yogurt and found that the group receiving the bacteria-enriched yogurt demonstrated dramatic changes on functional MRI scanning. In other words, the activity in their brains when they were confronted by these photographs that were a little bit disquieting uh, was different in comparison to those who didn't get the bacteria. And that research didn't get a lot of play, but I think it's profound. We're now beginning to see that gut bacterial changes uh, are related to depression uh, and correlate quite well with levels of inflammatory markers in the blood that are measurable. So we're beginning to connect those downstream dots that show that when the gut bacteria is disrupted, ultimately it leads to increased inflammation, which oddly enough seems to be a cornerstone player in creating depression. The neuroinflammation conversation I've found really fascinating, particularly because it goes from going, well, depression is a deficiency of serotonin to what's actually happening in the brain and, and what's actually driving this. What are some of the drivers of neuroinflammation? Well, interestingly, we spoke earlier about the leakiness of the gut barrier and how that allows certain chemicals, these pro-inflammatory mediators or cytokines to then enter the systemic circulation and affect the entire body, including the brain. We understand that the brain is somewhat protected from various toxins, if you will, by what is called the blood-brain barrier. And it turns out, interestingly, that many of the factors that increase the permeability of the gut lining similarly increase the permeability of this network called the blood-brain barrier that protects the brain. So sure, it's bad to have a leaky gut, but having a leaky brain is not necessarily a party either. So now we have a situation where 
damaging chemicals can make their way through the gut lining and ultimately into the brain. And it is there that inflammation is really quite uh, fundamentally damaging to not just the cells themselves, but their functionality. And therein lies the connection then between the gut and brain degeneration. That is getting a lot of play, a lot of research as of late. Tell me then, what should we be eating to nourish our brain and our our gut, I guess, ultimately? Well, those are not disparate. Uh, Nourishing your gut is nourishing your brain, is nourishing your heart, your immune system, uh, your detoxification system, your skin, your joints. It's not as if we would have a special diet for each of those issues uh, or parts of the body or systems uh, in case somebody had a particular problem with that area. So we shouldn't assume that we should gravitate towards a heart smart diet if we have heart disease or we have a family history of heart disease at the cost of maybe eating foods then that might be bad for the brain. No, it doesn't work that way. It brings up the notion of what underpins the so-called paleo movement. And that is looking at what our ancestors must have done, not just from dietary perspectives, but other lifestyle issues, going to sleep when the sun went down, moving around quite a bit during the course of our day and eating foods that are basically high in fiber, good fat, but a diet that's primarily vegetarian. If you choose to have some animal product, it should be clean. It should be grass-fed beef, wild fish, uh, free-range chicken, eggs from those chicken. Uh, But a diet, again, that's mostly vegetarian, colorful, mostly above ground vegetables, and a diet that really features a lot of fiber. And do you feel that all grains are equally bad? I think even though I wrote a book called Grain Brain, it's important that I think I get this moment to to indicate that we can eat some grain. Uh, It should be gluten-free, and that means uh, things like corn or rice are gluten-free. Oats in their natural state are gluten-free. And you know, what qualifies here in the state for whole grain in a food is 51%. So then you're allowed to say whole grain. Oh, It's crazy. But if you can find actual whole grain that is organic and non-GMO, having a small serving of organic rice or corn uh, on your plate for that one carb a day, absolutely, I think it's reasonable. And I guess then there's that fiber benefit as well for people. That's yeah. right. And again, that's from the author of Grain Brain. Yeah. And this is where I think people can get a little bit crazy. Um, And, you know, there can be a bit of a media storm of, oh, like it's really extreme, but it's about really doing the best that you can, you know, and for some people, they might be able to go completely grain free and for others, they need to, you know, look at getting rid of the gluten to begin with. Actually, let's talk about wheat specifically and, and gluten. Why is that such a problem? I think that primarily the gluten-free foods uh, that people tend to gravitate when they go gluten-free tend to be really horrendous in terms of their carb content, high in sugar. And even, uh, you know, the relationship between gluten, I think, is number one, tangential, because the foods that contain gluten are typically grain-derived and as such, again, are going to be high in carbs. Carbs raise blood sugar. That's how you gain weight. Carbohydrate-rich foods, sugar-rich foods, were traditionally the signal to the human physiology that winter is coming. It turns on various proteins and enzymes that trigger the body to make and store fat. So uh, that really is this powerful relationship. When we also consider that gluten, and more specifically gliadin, part of gluten, uh, increases gut permeability in many people, if not all humans, the increase in gut permeability is linked to inflammation. Inflammation antagonizes or blocks the uh, ability of insulin to do its job when it binds to its receptor. So it antagonizes the insulin receptor. So higher and higher levels of insulin need to be created because insulin function is being blocked. That ultimately uh, leads to a situation called insulin resistance. And because of that, uh, ultimately, 
those higher levels of insulin increase the production of body fat, but blood sugar rises as well because insulin ultimately becomes less effective. What is the end result of that for people? Well, you know, we understand that now body fat is far more than simply a storage depot of calories. Our ability to make body fat served us well in our Paleolithic time because it was this buffer against times of caloric scarcity. But body fat is far more than storage of calories. It's an extremely active endocrine tissue. Body fat, which is interestingly increased during inflammation, actually profoundly contributes to the inflammation itself, creating a feed-forward cycle. So you've just released the second version of Grain Brain. Correct. What did you find that was new between then and now? Was there anything stand out that surprised you? I've been asked that question a few times. And to me, the first thing that comes to mind is just the degree of validation. Grain Brain five years ago was out there and was highly criticized, uh, especially in the mainstream. And clinicians and researchers said, no, no, no. We've got to stay with our carbs and cut the fat, even then. Now, you know, we've seen such validation with really good peer-reviewed medical research saying that our bodies are desperate for good fat and that it's been the carbs all along the past 30 years that have really led to this explosion of diabetes, for example. Yeah, absolutely. How has it been for you pushing that and being on the fringe as a medical doctor? Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I'm a pain in the butt and I've always been a pain in the butt. And I love that because, you know, we need outliers. We need people who challenge the status quo because the status quo means accepting where we are now and saying that's good enough. And where we are now is absolutely not good enough with 40 million people being diagnosed right now globally with Alzheimer's, costing us $1 trillion a year, that's not good enough. Can you give me an example of a, of a patient of yours where something really remarkable happened? Let's take migraine headache, for example. As a matter of fact, we published this case of a gentleman, 52 years of age, had been on narcotics for 30 years. This was a very high-end investment banker, very functional, but required narcotics on a daily basis for his intractable migraine headaches. Did everything, took every medication, uh, had Botox injections, meditated, did everything he could, but never really addressed diet. The one thing that helped him was a gluten-free diet, which allowed him to go off his medications. So we actually published his, his results. So this is a really good example of that non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Where, exactly right. Yeah. Can you think of any others? Oh, yeah. So countless children with so-called ADHD. Uh, one a child, uh, interesting, uh, was, and actually we put his story in Grain Brain. Uh, he was um, a really sweet kid, but was diagnosed with ADHD. The parents were told that if he doesn't go on medication, he's going to get put back a grade in school. And so I said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll put him on a gluten-free diet, add some DHA, which is an omega-3 to his regimen, cut out the sugar. Let's see what happens. Well, two weeks later, the child's mother got a call from school, which is generally not a good thing. The teacher called to say, thank you for putting your son on medication. His change has been remarkable. So he didn't put, we didn't go on medication. He changed his diet, gluten-free, low sugar, and took some DHA. So that was really quite remarkable. So obviously autism spectrum disorders, ADHD, all of these things, they're on a steep, steep increase. How much of that do you think is because our microbiome is also on a quite a steep decline in diversity and numbers? I would say uh, very strongly related and very much in parallel. We know that the numbers are increasing because more and more children uh, are being diagnosed uh, because of the, I think, the move amongst uh, clinicians to increase their rate of diagnosing of these children because they're being uh, pushed to treat them with drugs. Here in America, the American College of 
uh, of pediatrics or American Academy of Pediatrics has lowered the age to four years of age at which child, a child can be diagnosed and treated for ADHD, which is really worrisome when you re- realize how underdeveloped the brain is and we're giving uh, amphetamines to those children that to me, even without the, the statistic I recently mentioned with reference to Parkinson's is scary business. So your um, son is the third generation doctor? That's right. Yeah. Why did he decide to go into medicine? He's a good kid and he wants to give back. I've learned so much from him. And uh, I learned so much from my father and now I'm learning from my son. So I'm kind of the, the I, get, I get it from both sides in a very good way. So he is uh, co-authoring a book about happiness about how our current lifestyle choices aren't getting us to happiness. They're getting us to uh, satisfying our immediate urges and pleasures, but keeping us actually from connecting to that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that allows us to be happy and empathetic and compassionate and plan for the future. We're being locked into brain anatomy that makes us narcissistic, seeking immediate pleasure, not hearing the other person's voice and not planning for the future. Can you tell me a bit more about that, about how using these devices and living as we are actually changes our brain anatomy? Absolutely. Well, we know that, uh, for example, diet is related. More inflammation, as you and I talked about earlier, actually inhibits the connection between the more primitive reptilian brain, an area called the amygdala, to the more sophisticated empathetic happiness part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. That pathway that connects the two called the anterior cingulate functions less well when we haven't had restorative sleep, when we are eating foods that are increasingly inflammatory, when we, through neuroplasticity, increase our connection to the amygdala and limit our connection to the part of the brain that deals with happiness. So our activities that are more self-centered, that are less involved in thinking about the other person, will strengthen our connection to the amygdala, the more reptilian brain, and at the same time, compromise our ability to access connection to the prefrontal cortex. When we're on our computers and other screen devices, especially on social media, we are being targeted day in and day out by advertisements specifically designed to capture our interest. These advertisements, these pop-ups, this clickbait uh, is programming us to respond in such a way to satisfy our desire for immediate satisfaction and pleasure. Creating a scenario where we think that our self-worth is not good enough, whether we're not thin enough, attractive enough, rich enough, uh, participating in life enough, and certainly not happy enough. And beyond that, if we buy this thing or engage in this activity, whatever it is we are being motivated to do, that will solve our problems. It's a very short-term reward pathway. Beyond that, this activity creates a scenario in which we are constantly bombarded by messages that reduce our sense of self-worth. Why? Because we are constantly comparing ourselves to these images of people on Instagram and Facebook, Uh, images of people living the wonderful life, always happy, always out doing great things when we may not be doing those things, not recognizing that the things people are posting are only the good things that they want you to believe is their life. When in reality, the, it, it appears that the people who post the most of these are people who really are the least happy. 
<laughs> it's really interesting that you bring that up because I've had this conversation with a few of the people I've been chatting with about Instagram health versus real health. So Instagram health is it's showing people that being healthy is being in a bikini on the beach and doing a backwards bend, you know, or, um, you know, being perf- having perfect makeup while you're eating a salad and this really unrealistic expectation of what health is. And people are following all of these gurus, um, 99% of them without any qualification whatsoever. And taking this as health. And I think it's a really dangerous thing. Oh, um, it, it is. And I, for one, don't aspire to doing a backbend wearing a bikini on the beach or having perfect makeup when I eat a salad. So I got the message loud and clear. <laughs> Let me just, there's one other point I want to make. It's really, I think, important and might be a bit surprising coming from me. And that is what we've learned uh, in the research for this book is the incredible power of reconnecting to nature, that this has huge effects in terms of lowering stress hormone, in terms of lowering inflammation, enhanced uh, sense of wanting to connect to the earth, which translates to increased empathy, just spending time in nature. As I mentioned earlier in our time together, uh, it gets back to the notion of when you're doing one thing, you're not doing another. So when you're spending a lot of time on the screen, you're not in, engaged in exposure to nature. My son sent me a picture yesterday. He was at a waterfall. And there was a, a, a woman uh, with the waterfall in the background uh, doing the back bend and just really in the moment. And in the foreground is another uh, young uh, girl who is there at the waterfall sitting, looking at her smartphone with her back to the waterfall. And it really just tells a story. If you're doing one thing, you're not doing something else. And then, you know, it, it's in terms of having the times to do those things that are really important, uh, like exercising and preparing your meals, making sure to connect with other people on a daily basis, making sure that you get exposure to nature on a daily basis. So it's really a question of priority and uh, a question of the difference between finding time or making time for certain things. If you say, I'm, an, I'm, I'm hoping I can uh, find the time for this, it means you, you're ranking those things lower. Making time for exercise, making time for exposure to nature ranks it higher in terms of prioritizing. Yeah, and it's about self-care, isn't it? And, yeah, and I mean, finding time uh, is hoping that the time arises when you can then, okay, I've got free time, then I can maybe do some exercise today. Tell me, what is a restorative sleep? What does that look like? You know, a lot has been written about the number of hours we should be sleeping. And uh, if that number, the magic number is eight, then so be it. But I think it's very important to understand that people may think they sleep for eight hours and nonetheless, it is not restorative. They're not getting uh, restorative sleep. If you look at their architecture on a sleep study, you realize that they're not getting non-REM, deep non-REM sleep. And in fact, their REM sleep might be compromised as well. And as such, they're not getting the full benefit of the restorative aspect of sleep by virtue of the fact that they may have sleep apnea, they may have periodic leg movements, they may be sleeping with somebody who snores and that wakes them up. There may be um, light on in the room. It has huge effects. Uh, It is associated with increased insulin resistance, which has a huge role to play in terms of the brain. It's associated with increased inflammatory markers and clinically, that non-restorative sleep is restored, is associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, and depression. So I think it's very important for people, I would say across the board, adults, to get a sleep study and see what's going on with respect to the nature and the restorative qualities of their sleep. Outside of getting a sleep study, are there any indicators that you're not sleeping well? Certainly. I mean, I think sleep has never been looked upon as really a very fundamental lifestyle issue in terms of looking at clinical manifestations of its perturbation. Sure, we talk about exercise and diet, but gosh, sleep never entered the narrative. And yet it's fundamentally important. You know, we spend a third of our lives in this activity. And it's not that everything shuts down during sleep and everything's kind of resting. Sleep is a very important, active part of our physiology, at which time 
Our experiences are consolidated into memory. They're triaged and compared to other experiences and compartmentalized. Newer research shows that sleep is actually the time when our glymphatic system is activated and allows the brain to actually uh, clean itself of debris. So I would say that anybody, for example, uh, suffering from any sort of chronic condition uh, should include a review of sleep quality uh, in that discussion of lifestyle issues that may predispose. Hardly anybody does. Headaches, cognitive issues, depression, uh, diabetes, overweight, breathing disorders, even issues with children, ADHD, always consider sleep. Do you know if there's any research on sleep in the microbiome? There is. As a matter of fact, disrupted sleep is clearly associated with what have been identified as non-productive changes or uh, health-threatening changes in the microbiome. And it may well be that that is a powerful mechanism uh, through which sleep has an influence on health uh, issues and risk down the line. But face it, uh, the research demonstrates as well that even our gut bacteria have circadian rhythmicity. I hope you're loving the information in the shift as much as I do. But maybe you're thinking, what do I need to do for me? Take our online assessment to discover what your gut is up to. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash quiz. The Shift! So... A lot of people in their 20s and 30s, they're sort of in the now. They're not really thinking like, what are my consequences now going to lead into Alzheimer's risk and this type of thing. But you've got a personal story around Alzheimer's, not to mention having seen probably thousands of patients. What do you say to people that, you know, aren't really thinking about what's going to happen in their 60s and 70s? Again, I I quote that literature and I ask them to read Grain Brain because we talk about it. We talk about how important our lifestyle choices are today, how important it is, for example, to keep your blood sugar really low in recognizing that average blood sugar is a powerful risk marker for developing shrinkage of your brain and cognitive decline. So uh, I quote the literature so people can understand this is science. And I think that it's important that I set an example, I explain what my diet is like, what my meditation program is like, uh, how I uh, invest in restorative sleep, how important exercise is, that my fasting blood sugar is 68, that I reach a beta hydroxybutyrate level, a ketone level of about 0.6 to 0.8 on a daily basis when I check. These are all kind of sophisticated ideas, but I tell them the reason I do it is twofold. A, because as you well mentioned, I've treated thousands of Alzheimer's patients. And with each one, family members asked me, Doc, you know, now that I know mom or dad has this problem, what can I do to mitigate my risk? That's reason number one. And reason number two is I went through this with my father. I held his hand through the worst parts of this disease. And I know what people go through. I understand the emotional component of this. And I also understand that I'm at increased risk. So I think that my actions set an important example for two reasons. Number one, that it's not just here, do what I say, not what I do. But B, that we can reduce risk. We can do a lot to prevent this disease. And I think too, when you when you hear all these things, it can be a bit doom and gloom, but the silver lining is that the solutions aren't that complicated. And if people can really get it and understand it and want to make the change, then they can prevent a lot of these things from happening. What's something that you're really passionate about right now? I believe that what we're seeing globally is something called disconnection syndrome, which really, that, that's not a name you will, would have heard of yet, but you will. It means that we are disconnected at so many levels from being on our path. We're disconnected from the gift of our genome because we're changing our gene expression for the negative. We're disconnected from the life supportive signaling coming from our microbiome 
the fact that our 100 trillion gut bacteria want to do everything they can to keep us healthy. We're disconnected from the area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex that allows us to be the people we really could be, compassionate, empathetic, planning for the future. We're disconnected from each other, from understanding the, the ideas of another individual. We're disconnected from our neighbors. We're disconnected from other countries. And we're disconnected from our planet. So what I'm passionate about moving forward at this stage in my life is the notion of giving people information about reconnecting through all of those examples that I just mentioned. Reconnecting to nature, reconnecting to the signals of our genome, reconnecting to our microbiomes, reconnecting most importantly to each other. Because the signals are not indicating that we're going in the right direction. And I think we absolutely can. And that's what I wake up in the morning thinking about, that we can do this. Uh, we've created a, a website, it isn't even up yet, called Global Reconnect. And it's going just to be, be about providing the tools that people can use to make those connections that can bring them personal happiness. And if you do that, I will be happier. I absolutely love that, David. What's something that really bugs you? Well, let me say that there are many things that could potentially bother me, but I'm doing my best to train myself to be like the wings of the duck that are oiled and water doesn't seep in. So are there things that could? Yes. When, when, when people don't want to appreciate the views of another and participate in dialogue, I find that challenging. It's disruptive for me, but I do my best not to let it bother me. I do my best to take a deep breath and embrace that there could be change looking at the positive side of that type of mentality. Thank you, I love that. So this program's called The Shift and it's about how people make shifts in their health. Um, but, I mean, we're always shifting and changing. Can you think of a time in your life where there's been a significant shift? The shift has clearly happened. Uh, I hardly recognize myself and I'm glad about it. I'm glad by, uh, to, to say that. But I don't know when it happened. So would you say that we're constantly shifting? Like it's just the constant progression for you? For me, yes. I mean, I know people have had epiphanies, have had an experience that has totally changed their life. And uh, I don't think it happens to everybody. You know, people describe this event uh, that it was a trauma or they or near-death experience. And I think mine has been more gradual but has been continually strengthened by my day-to-day -day experiences. If you could give just one piece of advice for people that wanted to make a shift in their health, what would it be? I would say to take pause and to take a deep breath. That's two, but to take pause. And while you're taking the pause, take a deep breath. <laughs> or I guess I could build a lot into that moment. And that is to, uh, to listen. That is the main uh, key, I would say, is to listen to others, to listen to your own inner voice, to listen to what we are being told, not just by people, but by what we see happening around us in terms of the planet, and to be a good listener and not always speak. Because the messages are there. The messages are very, very loud and clear. And that, I think, will then open the door for the whole list of other things that are important. Thank you so much. My pleasure. There was so much amazing information in this episode. So let's review and make sure that we've gotten the key points. Number one, if we want to look after our brain health, we need to look after the health of our gut. If you want to know more about this, I'd recommend tuning in to episode six of The Shift. Number two, Conditions like Alzheimer's, dementia, and memory loss are largely preventable by living a healthy lifestyle, exercising, sleeping well, and avoiding gluten, sugars, and processed food. Number three, there are very strong links between childhood conditions like ADHD and diet, and there is so much that we can do to prevent them. 
These conditions are steadily on the rise, so we need to look to our diet and lifestyle to stop this from happening. Number four. Humans as a whole are suffering from a condition called disconnection syndrome, where we are becoming more and more disconnected from nature, from each other, from ourselves, disconnected from our genomes and disconnected from the microbes that are in, around and amongst us. This deep level of disconnection affects our health and wellness in multiple layers. And you can hear more about it in David's new book, Brainwash, which shows the path to reconnection in these areas. Number five. My personal favourite, listen. Listen to your own voice, your intuition when it comes to trying to make the shift. If we can slow down and take pause, we can actually hear what our bodies and minds are trying to tell us. Learning is great, but action is better. Here are a few things you could do as a result of this conversation in order to help you shift your health and your life. Number one. One of the very best things that you can do to preserve your brain health is to reduce the amount of sugar and grains you're consuming. Focus especially on high carbohydrate products like bread, crackers, pasta, and sweets. Anything made with white flour or gluten containing grains is particularly detrimental. Also, look to reduce your sugar intake across the board too. While this can be tricky at first, aim to slowly change the way that you're eating and incorporate different foods to help. If you're stuck, join our group, where we regularly share recipes and useful info on what you need to do to make this shift. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash group. Number two, up your healthy fats. Your brain needs lots of omega-3 fatty acids that come from foods like sardines and other small oily fish, flax seeds and walnuts. Organic animal fats, avocado and coconut oil are all healthy fat sources that will help you feed your brain. Number three, please improve your sleep. You want to aim for eight hours sleep every single night. Try not to go to bed too late. Being in bed by 9 to 10 p.m. is the most ideal time and waking up at 5 to 6 a.m. is the most ideal time for waking. Avoid coffee and other stimulants, particularly in the late afternoon, and turn the lighting way down low before bed to encourage the action of the sleep-wake cycle. There was so much amazing information in this conversation, and I'm sure that each and every one of you can at least take away one thing to change as a result of it. I personally found it so inspiring to meet with David and have this discussion, and I hope that you got something great out of it too. Please let us know by sharing on social media and tagging myself, Catherine Maslin, or The Shift Clinic so that we can hear what you have to say. You can find out more about David and get links to purchase his books at drperlmutter.com. That's D-R-P-E-R-L-M-U-T-T-E-R.com. Dr. David has also recently released a free online docu-series called Alzheimer's, The Science of Prevention. It focuses on the real science in revealing what you can do to prevent Alzheimer's. As always, we'll provide the links to this in the show notes so that you can check it out. In the next episode of The Shift, we meet the wonderful Dr. Tom O'Brien, who discusses some important concepts that will turn what you know about the medical management of disease on its head. Coming up on The Shift. Tell me about dairy in the context of gut health, but also in total health. Cow milk protein is meant for a cow. Why now do we have this huge increase in autoimmunity? Oh, there's no question about the numbers. The overall category of the contributing factors is the environmental toxicity. Tell me a bit about what you found around infertility and gluten. Oh my goodness, that's what got me into a lot of that. Actually, that's what got me into this whole world. Have you listened to season one of The Shift? If you're enjoying the expert series, you'll love season one, where we deep dive into the field of gut health with 25 of the world leaders in this area. Head back to your podcast app and find episode one. It's a great place to start.